Thank you. All right, so. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so glad you're here for our Advocacy Day training. This is our second of two trainings. Um, only one was necessary, but some people have actually chosen to attend uh, a second time because some of the legislation we're talking about is a little bit complex. And, um, you know, uh, some people just want to feel more comfortable with the content, but we're going to try to prepare you as much as possible for the meetings with the lawmakers. So um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Schlager, Vice President of Public Policy at Force. And I have my colleague, Lisa Peabody online. I think you can see her picture there. Um, Lisa uh, works with me. We are a team. Uh, generally, I focus more on the federal level policy while Lisa handles our patient advocate leaders program and our state advocacy, but we very much um, collaborate on almost everything. So we finally call ourselves the Lisas. And if you aren't sure which Lisa to reach out to, just know that if you send one of us a message, we will get you to the right Lisa. So uh, don't, don't stress about remembering who does what. Um, this is our agenda for tonight. So I just kind of did our little introduction. We are going to do a brief overview of FORCE, the organization, and our goals for our Federal Advocacy Day. And then we're going to dive into our legislative asks. And basically, that's three pieces of legislation that we've chosen to prioritize for our meetings with lawmakers this year. We'll go into each one uh, in a little bit of depth and then just know that we will have additional resources available to you. And also know that all of the lawmaker offices are going to receive a one page handout on the legislation with statistics and other things that you don't have to remember. So you just need to remember the big picture stuff and know how to share your story. Um, then we're gonna talk about the Advocacy Day platform. Some of you have done Advocacy Day before, you know the platform, you know it's relatively easy to use. Um, if you just signed up for Advocacy Day in the past day or two, you may not be in the system yet, but know that you will receive your invitation to the platform in the next day or two. And then we'll talk briefly about meeting etiquette, although I think everybody now has gotten so used to Zoom and video calls that it's not uh, really, it's not, it's a non-issue. Um, so as Lisa Peabody suggested, please mute your microphone unless you're speaking for now. And we're gonna use the chat for questions. Um, I mentioned uh, access to the Advocacy Day portal. Many of you should have received an email today. If you don't see it, uh, if you were registered more than a few days ago, um, if you don't see it, check your junk folder because sometimes it goes into spam and we'll, re we'll revisit this later. Um, we will have a time for questions after the discussion of each piece of legislation. So just hold your questions um, or you can put them in the chat, but just know that we will have uh, an opportunity to discuss each piece of le legislation independently. So uh, Lisa Peabody will be monitoring the chat and we'll get to those questions uh, as they come. So for anyone who's new or isn't terribly familiar with FORCE, we are a national nonprofit organization that specifically focuses on the hereditary cancer community. And that includes um, two populations. We are hereditary cancer uh, survivor or thriver population. So people who've been diagnosed with cancer, as well as people who are what we call previvors, people who are high risk, uh, either due to family history or a known genetic mutation. And we like to think of ourselves as an organization that serves the needs of anybody uh, affected by hereditary cancer or at risk of hereditary cancer uh, in the adult community. We don't really tackle childhood cancers, um, although we do some education around that. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website if that's something that is of interest. We have essentially four pillars of programs. 
education our support and support are very important to us. Um, and we have a substantial amount of information around hereditary cancer and everything related to it, um, as well as really customized uh, support, whether it be one-on-one -on -one peer support or support groups. Um, we also engage in research. We don't fund research or conduct it ourselves necessarily, but we collaborate and we recruit for research. We really want to encourage our community to participate in research studies because only with participation in research can we find better cures, better prevention, and so forth. And then finally, we have our public policy arm. Uh, our focus historically has been federal policy just because as a small organization with one person dedicated to policy, that was all we could manage. We have substantially increased those efforts and delved into the state policy realm over the past couple of years. And um, we're making a great impact there. So we're very excited about that. Just a quick overview. Everybody um, has probably heard of the BRCA mutations, but there are many different hereditary cancer genetic mutations that have been discovered and even beyond this list. So we need to recognize that um, even though they might be different mutations, there are similar psychosocial issues, similar access issues, um, and similar, you know, similar concerns about risk and family members. And so that's where we all have commonality. This is just a great chart to summarize uh, the different types of cancer that are uh, known to be associated with hereditary cancer. And there are others, but these are the big ones. And you can see how many different genes have been confirmed to increase risk in these particular types of cancer. So um, there's a lot of overlap here and we're st still learning more and more. So expe expect that this list may grow over time. And that's why the work we do and advocacy is so important because the community that's affected by hereditary cancer is only going to grow with the more we learn and the more that people get genetic testing. So we're here tonight to discuss and prepare for Advocacy Day. And this is our third year. So I wouldn't say we're in our infancy, but we're definitely still, um, you know, in the early years of doing this. Uh, we do it virtually so that more people can join and participate. Although someday we hope to have an in-person component as well. So the goals of Advocacy Day are really pretty simple. We wanna raise awareness about the unique needs of the people in our community. So people with or at risk of hereditary cancer. Our needs are unique compared to the, the general cancer population. We're at risk of multiple cancers. Our family members may be affected. Uh, our risks are obviously much higher than the average population. So that's quite unique. And a lot of lawmakers don't really know or understand about that. We want to emphasize that coverage of things like high risk screening and preventive services actually save lives and money, but also that innovative therapies are needed and we want to make sure that people have access to those as well. And finally, sponsorship of the key legislation that we're talking about is going to make a real difference for people in the lawmakers districts because that's why you're here. They don't want to hear from us. They want to hear from people in their district, in their state, who can share their stories. And your story is the most important part there. So we're going to have three asks this year. Um, for those of you who've been involved previously, the Reducing Hereditary Cancer Act is something you're probably familiar with. Um, we'll dive into that later. But we have two other pieces of legislation this year that are new to um, our Advocacy Day. And one is called the Orphan Cures Act. And we're gonna talk about that first. And then the other one is called the Safe Step Act. Uh, and we'll get into those details as we move through each piece of legislation. 
So we're going to start first with the Orphan Drug Act or, or the Orphan Cures Act. So the issue that we're trying to fix is that Medicare has a new drug price negotiation program. Medicare actually controls a lot of the access to uh, therapies and a lot of private insurers follow what Medicare does and so does Medicaid. So it's very important that Medicare have favorable policies. Part of this price negotiation program gave a very, very narrow exception or exclusion for orphan drugs. And we're gonna talk about what orphan drugs are, but basically the exclusion is gonna compromise the development of unique and novel therapies for smaller cancer communities. And we're very concerned about that. And we wanna make sure that that issue is remedied or fixed um, so that our most vulnerable patients, people in the ovarian cancer population, for instance, or pancreatic cancer population who have genetic mutations, so that they uh, have access more rapidly to the therapies that might help them. So let's give some history. In 1983, there was a piece of legislation or a law called the Orphan Drug Act that was passed. And that law aimed to incentivize the development of treatments for small disease communities. Now, you may not think of cancer as a small disease, but there are types of cancer that are considered orphan or small disease communities. Ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer are two of those. And so this particular law applies to diseases that affect 200,000 people or less, and that includes pancreatic and ovarian cancer. And um, because of the law, it spurred investment in all kinds of therapies for these smaller cancer communities that previously drug developers didn't really want to develop drugs for less than 200,000 people because it's not financially beneficial to them. They'd rather develop drugs that they can sell to a million people. Um, and so it really, this drug, uh, this Orphan Drug Act spurred innovation. And the result is an exponential increase in the number of FDA approved drugs for smaller disease and cancer communities. And you can see this little graphic here. It talks about the types of incentives that are offered under this program. Um, the one pager that we've developed, and you'll find that in the Advocacy Day portal, has very uh, more specific um, statistics on this. So essentially, there's some terms you need to be aware of. An orphan drug designation, and the key word is designation, is a company going to the FDA and said, we want to research this drug to see if it works for this smaller cancer or smaller disease community. And it doesn't mean that they have a drug that absolutely works, they just wanna research it. And so the FDA can approve that designation and they immediately get some incentives for that research. And that's helpful to them to conduct that research. Once they conduct the research and they say, wow, this drug actually, we think it's it works in this community, then they go for an orphan drug approval. And then the FDA approves it to treat that specific, for that specific community. And it's also known as treating it for a specific indication. So for instance, PARP inhibitors are unique drugs that were developed specifically for people with BRCA genetic mutations. And the first approval was for people with BRCA mutations who had ovarian cancer. And so that was the first indication for the drug, the first approval, its use was for ovarian cancer. Um, and we know that 15% of orphan drug designations, meaning the research, result in an approval or um, for, for that drug. So this is a very, th these terms are kind of confusing, but you'll understand as we move on. 
So as I mentioned, we have PARP inhibitors, and they're drugs that are specifically for people with BRCA mutations, although they're being researched in other mutations like ATM now. And so the initial research was done in ovarian cancer, and they found it to be very effective. So then they got an orphan drug approval for ovarian cancer treatment. But then they said, let's see, hmm, would this work for another type of cancer? So then they went to the FDA and said, we'd like a designation to research the PARP inhibitor in pancreatic cancer. And so the FDA said, yes, you should do that. And they gave them some incentives to do the research. And then they found that it worked in pancreatic cancer as well. So then they got an orphan drug approval for pancreatic cancer. Both of those are rare cancers. They went on eventually to find that it works for most BRCA positive cancers. So things like breast cancer and pr prostate cancer. Those are not orphan communities. They're bigger than 200,000. So once they expanded to those communities, they lost their orphan drug status. They lost the incentives to develop the drugs for these smaller communities because now they are reaching a broader community. But you can see how important those incentives are for smaller cancer or smaller disease communities. So as I mentioned, there's a new Medicare drug price negotiation program. It's part of the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA. You don't have to know anything about that. All, all you have to know is that the goal is to reduce drug prices and that's a good thing. But the way it's been structured, we are worried that um, it's actually going to inhibit or prevent research for orphan drugs. And that's a problem because it's one thing if the drug reaches the masses, but we know that these smaller communities really struggle. So um, the way it works is once an orphan drug or orphan therapy is designated for research, it's no longer excluded from price negotiation under the Inflation Reduction Act or the, the drug price negotiation. So that basically, think about it this way, you have your ovarian cancer approval and you say, now I wanna research it in pancreatic cancer. The minute that you get the approval to research it in pancreatic cancer, you lose the benefit of the orphan drug designation and now you, your drug can be considered for price negotiation, which means you'll ultimately make less money um, through this uh, program. It really reduces the incentives to develop drugs for these small communities. And we're afraid that ultimately the manufacturers are just gonna say, "Never mind, I'm not gonna put this drug out for ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer. I'm gonna wait until I can treat a bigger population. And that's gonna hurt our community of people who have some of these more rare cancers. So the solution is this particular piece of legislation, it's called the Orphan Cures Act. You can see here who the sponsors are. Um, and the goal of this legislation is literally just to carve out this particular class of drugs from the negotiation program. So basically it would ensure that the protections remain to incentivize research into these more rare cancers and rare diseases. And it would allow those drugs to remain excluded from price negotiation as long as they're exclusively for these smaller cancer communities. Um, so that's kind of the big picture. Uh, and I, I know it seems a bit complex, but straightforward is we wanna make sure that there are incentives to develop drugs for the smaller cancer communities and to honor what the Orphan Drug Act intended back in 1983 and has resulted in today. Um, so now we can have a little Q&A around this particular piece of legislation. And I wanna mention that um, I am not the expert on the legal aspects of this. So we actually have a guest at least I think we do. Her name is Amy Rick, and she's with uh, the law firm Levitt Partners, and they are helping lead the Orphan Cures Act um, efforts 
and she is a very knowledgeable expert. So if I can't answer a question, hopefully she can. Um, so Amy, I don't know if you're on the line, uh, but we can try to unmute you or you can unmute. I'm me. here, Lisa. Oh, excellent. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Good to see you. Um, so Lisa Peabody, do we have any questions in the chat? Yeah, we just got one from um, who wanted a clarification that once the orphan designation is removed, is it removed from both the development incentives and the price negotiation exclusion? Okay, so let's remember a designation is simply the ability for the drug to be researched, right? And an approval is the, you know, the drug has been approved to treat people. So the designation is not removed. The designation stays, they can still research the drug, but the original drug, so let's go back to our example of ovarian cancer. Ovarian, uh, PARP, PARP inhibitors are approved for ovarian cancer. They have a designation to research it now in pancreatic. So now they lose the sort of the protection for the the drug under the ovarian cancer approval um so it, 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 am i explaining it right amy that may be yeah right way. this is um everything you really didn't need me lisa understands this beautifully <laughs> but let me spend a couple minutes actually trying to say the same thing in a different way because it is complex. It's it's a system that all kind of makes sense once you get the whole system, but to hear it the first time is mind numbing, right? So let me just introduce myself again, Amy Comstock Brick. I'm a principal at Levitt Partners and I'm working with Lisa and many of other organizations in a task force that is focused specifically on this problem. Um, so many of you may have heard about the drug pricing program under Medicare. It's really important for me to emphasize that our task force and this legislation does not go to pro or con whether drug pricing negotiation was the right route in this country to lower drug prices, which everybody agrees drug prices need to get lowered. And one of our challenges is that some of the staff on the Hill think think if we're talking about the Medicare drug price negotiation program, it looks like we're about to talk about drug pricing, right? But actually all the reason drugs get invented, whether we like it or not, pharmaceutical companies, big or small, they have to make money and they make a lot of money off drugs. And so a lot of, of drug development is about financial incentives. And Lisa's absolutely right. When the Orphan Drug Act was passed 40 years ago, 41 now, it, it the whole theory behind it was financial incentives for more drugs for rare diseases. And of course, to get drugs, you need the research. So when the drug, when the law was passed in 1983, we had 38 drugs approved by FDA for rare diseases. We now have over 600, and you don't need these statistics, it's just to give you a flavor. We now have over 600 approved for 1100 plus indications. But 95% of rare diseases still don't have a treatment. So great progress. Um, Lisa said exponential growth, yes. But we need to keep that progress going. That's what this conversation is about. So the drug pricing law didn't amend the Orphan Drug Act. That still works. But it kind of turned on the head on its head, the incentives, because all, all the financial incentives that you get under the Orphan Drug Act, 25% tax credit on the cost of clinical trials, waiver of user fee, all the ones Lisa mentioned, get undermined if your drug might be subject to drug price negotiation. Two key points is that research and development of drugs for rare diseases takes longer generally and is more expensive generally because your populations are so small. So recruiting for trials is harder, all that. And the return on investment for rare disease drugs, and this is really the heart of the problem, the business plan usually assumes multiple approvals because you don't generally, even though we all have views about how much money pharmaceutical companies make, you don't generally begin to get a return on your research investment until at least the second approval. And what this law does, as Lisa said, is say, oh, okay, rare, rare orphan drugs, which are 
drugs for rare diseases um, are special, so we'll keep them out, but only for one approval. And it's almost like they didn't understand how the system works, that you need multiple approvals. So, um, so that's what this law, the Orphan Cures Act does, is say, look, as long as a drug is only approved, it gets designations out of the picture because it's nuts that you would never designate it, that you would penalize doing more research on a drug whether and whether it's good for another disease. So what this proposed legislation says is, as long as a drug is only approved for rare diseases, it will remain excluded from drug price negotiation. But the moment it's approved for any non-rare disease, the whole drug, the whole drug is eligible for drug price negotiation for its uses for rare disease, non-rare disease, for anything. And I'll um, say in our context, disease is cancer. So yes. put the word cancer wherever she says disease, but yeah. this also serves all kinds of different, uh, you know, disease areas. Um, we're just, we're, we just happen to be part of that. Um, I also right. want to mention that going back and fixing uh, a piece of legislation or a regulation is not uncommon. So a lot of times, you know, new policies are put out, new regulations are put out, and they just didn't, recognize there might have unintended consequences. And that's what this is one of those situations. And that's why we are on board with this. We 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 do think drug prices need to be lower. But let's focus on the drugs that, you know, appeal to the masses and serve millions and millions of people and make sure that the folks who really need help, the groups that are less than 200,000, don't have any roadblocks or barriers when it comes to incentivizing the drug makers to get new drugs out there. So um, any other questions? Like I said, we will have a handout with more specific statistics. You'll have access to that. The lawmakers will have access to that. We also outline this in a sample script for the lawmaker meetings. So um, you don't there was to... one more question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you. Does it make a difference whether the drug is, is developed by big companies or small companies? Mm. No, and that's a great question. No, it does not. But um, again, because the exclusion, the drug program only applies to that drug, not to all the drugs manufactured by that company. So Johnson & Johnson, you know, is makes killer lots of money off drugs X, Y, and Z, but could have a rare disease drug. We still want to incentivize, doesn't matter how you feel about Johnson & Johnson, we still want Johnson & Johnson to put some of their resources into researching pancreatic cancer. And so the exclusion from drug price negotiation would still apply for them until until and if they get an approval for a larger cancer or for a completely different disease, at which time um, then they just go throw into the, get into the pot like all other drugs for common diseases. Because the truth is they don't have a lot of incentive to develop drugs incentive. for these small yeah. communities. I mean, they'd rather reach the masses and make big bucks. So we kind of need to encourage them to develop the drugs yeah. for these little slivers of the community. And I want to say with the growth of genetics and genomics, I think there's going to be more and more slivers of small communities. For instance, one day we might see a specific treatment just for, oh, uh, let's say, colorectal cancer uh, patients with Lynch syndrome. So that's how they can start slicing. Uh, they're going to be creating targeted treatments, and those are going to be orphan communities because they're a small sliver of a broader community. So we, as people who are affected by hereditary cancer, can understand that our mutations are really what makes us unique, um, and it will be a target for future treatments. So um, I hope that makes sense. Um, if there aren't any additional questions. There is another one in the chat. Thanks, Amy. And, and also when I first got into the health policy world as my profession, the number of people you use, the number of diseases, rare diseases, 
sizes people used was 6,000. Mm -hmm. It is now 10,000. And that's not because aside from COVID, there's new diseases in the world. That's because we're, as Lisa's saying, we're learning more and more that that um, conditions or types or genetics that we used to lump all people together. We now see the differentiation, which helps researchers target very specifically that mutation or that disease, that variant, and it becomes its own disease. So it's really important to protect the integrity of the research for rare diseases. The question is, how do we define rare? It's a population in the United States at a given moment of 200,000 or less. That's um, the key, 200,000. And you may not realize that BRCA positive ovarian cancer affects less than 200,000. If you really had interest, you could go to the FDA website and look up orphan drug, you know, designations or orphan drug uh, indications, and you could see what types of drugs uh, or therapies have been approved for that. But um, suffice to say, ovarian and pancreatic are two, um, and there are numerous others. There's a whole organization called the National Organization for Rare Diseases, where that's all they work with is these smaller groups. Just yep. it's it is pretty rampant around the country, and it's it's hard for these groups to feel heard sometimes. So we want to make sure that um, you know that our ovarian cancer folks are getting the benefits just like our breast cancer folks and our prostate cancer folks. They're equally important in our community. So that's that's really our impetus uh, behind supporting this legislation. And um, I, I, any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah. Is there, yes, there is another question in the chat. There is, um, there is resistance to changing the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, which was a massive piece of legislation, and the Medicare drug price negotiation program was a large part of massive legislation. It's partisan resistance. It's not substantive resistance. It's not about the provisions, maybe a little provisions in the drug pricing law, but not no one, when it was passed, this provision was not really given a lot of attention, which is why we think it's possibly a mistake. It is so, it is so unthinking, so unwise, and so inconsistent with how FDA has incentivized research for rare disease drugs in the last 40 years that that many people myself included believe it was an oversight or a mistake in your meetings you may see again there's a partisan divide um and and we are not partisan we are not saying we want to revise the inflation reduction act we just want to carve this little piece I out and we're you know it, the rest of the law will stay as is but we are seeing the, the more conservative lawmakers are more understanding about this and the more liberal lawmakers are concerned about it because they really do strongly support the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think that's important for us to say, you know what, we support the IRA too. We support lower drug prices. We just don't want these small communities um, to suffer as a result. And I don't think that was the intention of the program. So make sure if somebody says, well, are you trying to undermine or you know question the Inflation Reduction Act? Not at all. We just wanna make sure that these small communities still get ex ex you know, expedient access to therapies. And the way that this was set up, it sort of undermines that. So, um, so good and questions. We will have well, a few one more point, Lisa, oh. just on the bipartisan. The originators of this legislative fix that we need knew that this the issue might be partisan because everything about the Medicare drug price negotiation program is partisan. So they're being very good about making sure they have the same number of Democrats and Republicans sponsoring this bill. So even on its face, it's bipartisan right now. So Excellent. Um, Lisa, are we wanting the advocates to say that we do support the IRA or are we wanting them to say that we support We are in favor of the IRA. Prices? We okay. are. I think okay. there are things that could be improved and we are contributing to those conversations. 
but we are not taking a stance that we're opposed to the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we want to make that very clear. And I okay. think it's important. Um, okay. So we're going to let Amy go because- yes, but Sue, Sue, Sue Williams in the chat, she's oh, right. Sue. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a good point that it's just a, an unfortunate problem with a simple fix. Exactly. That's a great point. Um, so Amy has graciously given us her time. We're going to let her go. Know that if you have questions about this and we can't answer them, we will forward them on for Amy and her team no to address. We also have a drop-in Q&A scheduled for Monday night. So if you have additional questions and you're feeling uncertain, feel free to drop in for a few minutes and we will try to help you work through your questions. So Amy, thank you. Um, so this is sort of the conclusion of our first piece of legislation. We're gonna let Amy run and we are gonna move on now to our next issue. Um, this is something that we have focused on our last two advocacy days. So essentially uh, most of us here are familiar with the term previvors, but the medical term is unaffected carriers. Uh, so they're people who have genetic mutations, who have not had cancer. And the, those people who are at increased risk of cancer don't have coverage under Medicare uh, for things like genetic testing or the downstream screening and risk-reducing surgeries. Um, so we have a piece of legislation that will attempt to fix that issue. But before we dive into that, I thought it would be important to talk about what Medicare does cover, because it's important to understand, just like right, you know, private health insurance, what is covered and then understanding where the gaps are. So we know Medicare covers one baseline mammogram um, for individuals who are ages 35 to 39. That's just to get you know, a baseline. And then annual screening is covered with a mammogram starting at age 40. If you need clinical breast exams, which believe it or not, are not recommended for the general population, but they are recommended for higher risk individuals, women can get those uh, or individuals, we don't wanna be gender exclusive, uh, individuals can get those uh, at their well woman visit under the Medicare program every two years. Also, if you're thinking more about cervical or gynecologic cancer, uh, it covers one pap test uh, and a pelvic exam every two years. So there's no option for um, ovarian cancer screening, for instance, or an annual pelvic exam, which can be important for anybody who's higher risk. Um, the other things that are covered are um, prostate cancer screenings, even though they're not necessarily covered by private insurers, under Medicare, they are covered once every 12 months for men starting at age 50. And that age is very important. The age is important because if you're high risk for prostate cancer, members of our community are supposed to start screening at age 40. So men under the age of 50, between 40 and 50 would face barriers. You may be asking yourself, well, wait a second, aren't we talking Medicare? Medicare is age 65 and up. Generally, yes, but about 15% of all people on Medicare are actually younger than 65. These are people with disabilities or other issues um, that have qualified them to be uh, eligible for Medicare and Social Security uh, or Medicare and Medicaid benefits. So we do have people on Medicare who are under the age of 65 and they are facing barriers in accessing the care that they need. The other thing uh, that Medicare covers is colon cancer screening. Now this is where Medicare actually does pretty well. While most Medicare screenings are only focused on the general population or the average risk population, a few years ago, uh, lawmakers changed that from colon cancer screening. And so Medicare will cover a colonoscopy every two years. Now, if you have Lynch syndrome, the recommendation is every one to two years. And most people err on the side of one year, um, understandably, especially as you get older. Um, so you would get full coverage every two years. And if you wanted to do a screening 
in the interim and at the one year mark, you would be charged out of pocket um, for the co-pays and co-insurance. Um, so that would typically be 20% of the full cost. So it could add up um, because colonoscopies are not cheap. For the general population, colonoscopy would be covered every six years in general or every four years after um, a, a less invasive test called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Um, but it's important that we differentiate between the average risk or general population and the high risk population. Um, so what, what that leads to is coverage gaps. Essentially, people with, uh, with or at risk of hereditary cancer, um, currently Medicare only covers genetic testing if you already have cancer. It's a little bit too late then, in our opinion. The goal is to prevent or, you know, or catch cancer earlier. So we want Medicare to cover genetic testing if you um, meet the criteria for that. Similarly, we have people who are coming into the Medicare system already knowing they have a mutation, or maybe they pay out of pocket and learn they have a mutation while they're on Medicare. But then Medicare is really not supposed to cover the quote, supplemental screenings or risk-reducing surgeries. So this legislation really aims to remedy these problems. Um, it, it hopes to um, cover things like breast MRIs or um, annual colonoscopy, or even um, trying to think upper endoscopy or, for, or ultrasound for pancreatic cancer screening. Um, we've got people on the line here who can attest to the fact that uh, Medicare has denied risk-reducing surgeries because individuals don't have a cancer diagnosis. And unfortunately, that's not been applied uh, equitably across the U.S. So in some areas, they deny it. In other areas, sometimes they cover it. But the reality is the Medicare policy says it's not supposed to be covered. And only the most savvy of savvy patients uh, with the most lenient, uh, you know, uh, customer service reps and appeals reps are able to get that coverage. Uh, in certain parts of the country, we have seen coverage, but they're actually scaling back on that. So uh, it's becoming quite an issue. And we want to make sure that people have equitable coverage across the country. So the solution is the Reducing Hereditary Cancer Act. We actually helped, we basically wrote this legislation. Um, our champion in Congress is Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She has a BRCA mutation herself. So she's very invested in this legislation. Lisa Murkowski was, is the lead in the Senate and she's invested because of a, a, a lovely family in Alaska was unfortunately affected by the exclusions and the gaps in Medicare coverage, and she got on board. But you can see that we have strong support. Um, the act would specifically aim to modify the Medicare statutes so that it, they can cover genetic testing if you meet the uh, medical guidelines, basically based on, let's say, uh, if you have a known hereditary cancer mutation in your family, or if you have a family or personal history of cancer that meets the criteria for testing. And these are all guideline recommended. And I wanna point that out because a lot of times lawmakers say, well, what are you gonna do, test everybody? The answer is no. There are very, very specific criteria for who should be tested and only those who meet the criteria will be offered testing and it will only be covered for those individuals. And then for those who test positive, the legislation would modify the statutes to allow Medicare to cover all of the guideline recommended care. And when we say cover, it doesn't mean coverage with zero out-of-pocket cost. It just means they can't deny it. So really the impact to the Medicare system is not overwhelming. Um, we understand that some people still can't afford those co-pays and we are gonna work on that, but this is sort of the low hanging fruit at this point. Um, so basically it would allow Medicare to cover breast MRIs. People would no longer get a denial because this type of screening is not covered. Similarly, we know for ovarian cancer, there's no effective screening. So the only true option is risk reducing surgery. 
we've had lawmakers question, is that appropriate for the Medicare population? 65 is young. 65 to 75, going through a laparoscopic surgery is not a non-issue. These are women who are already in menopause. It's minimally invasive and not very expensive. So there's no reason that we shouldn't be doing this for our, our healthy Medicare population. So those are the goals. And I think what's also very important to note is that private insurance, so people with you know, employment or with uh, employer sponsored health insurance or people who are uh, on what they call Obamacare, their health plans mostly cover this stuff. Now they may have to pay co-pays or meet their deductible, but it's covered. Similarly, most Medicaid programs cover this. It's only Medicare who is breaking the trend basically. And that doesn't make sense. It's, it's just not equitable. So we wanna see that remedied. Um, so that's what the purpose of this legislation is. I also want to note that there is another piece of legislation that is separate, but it sort of um, aligns with this. And basically, it's called the Access to Genetic Counselor Services Act. Right now, genetic counselors are not approved healthcare providers under Medicare, which is also kind of a little crazy because genetic counseling is so important. Um, so we do support that. And if uh, anybody asks, you know, we think these two pieces of legislation go hand in hand, you don't have to memorize it, but just say we do think genetic counseling is very important and we need to increase access to genetic counselors. Um, I'm sure we have a few questions, but I also yep, yep. <laughs> want to note, and it's important for everybody to understand, what is the resistance? What is the opposition to this? The main argument is cost. And the reason the main argument is cost is because there is going to be an initial outlay of money to test Medicare beneficiaries before they see the benefit by reduced uh, cancer episodes or diagnoses and earlier stage cancer diagnoses. And unfortunately, the way that our system is set up right now that is deterring lawmakers from wanting to support it. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. We believe long-term this will save the system money. Um, obviously prevention is cheaper than cure in our mind. If you compare the cost, for instance, of a risk-reducing hysterectomy compared to a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, which is typically advanced stage, it's like apples and oranges. We're talking twenty to thirty thousand dollars compared to half a million or more. Um, so that's where we think it will make a big difference. And we uh, are currently having a private uh, research study done and analysis done to try to demonstrate this. Unfortunately, one of the big components for legislation like this is what's called a CBO score, a Congressional Budget Office score. And CBO has not been willing to score this, but even if CBO did at this point, it wouldn't reflect well because CBO only looks at cost, not savings. So let's move on to questions. Um, All right, I'm gonna start with, someone um, wants to know, is reconstruction part of this screening that you're talking about? Where breast reconstruction fit in? is a separate part of coverage. And breast reconstruction is covered under Medicare. Um, risk reducing surgery would be covered under if this law passed, whereas currently risk reducing mastectomy is not supposed to be covered. But the, the law said, or basically the way Medicare works, just like the other laws in the US, is if a woman, uh, if the mastectomy is covered, breast reconstruction must be covered as well. So if Medicare covered a risk-reducing mastectomy, breast reconstruction would also be covered. Great. Um, just wanted to clarify, a clinical breast exam is the doctor's physical exam of the breast. Someone asked that, just want to make right. sure everyone understood You know, uh, they when used they to check your... breast self-exam and then when yeah. the OBGYN, they might do a breast exam on you. Mm -hmm. um, there has been 
some debate around whether that's valuable these days. We still believe it's valuable and we think it's important, especially for higher risk individuals. All right. Are things like pelvic ultrasounds and CA-125 tests also not covered? Currently, said, they are not they supposed aren't. to be covered yep, they aren't. because that's, they are considered mm -hmm. um, preventive care that's above and beyond what the general population needs. Now, the tricky thing is most national guidelines, even those for high-risk individuals, acknowledge that that transvaginal ultrasound and CA125 are not very effective for screening ovarian cancer, for ovarian cancer. And so um, typically it can be recommended for women who are, say, under the age of 40 or 45 uh, when they're not quite ready to remove their ovaries. But um, I, I can't guarantee how that would be interpreted uh, once an individual is on Medicare and over the age of 65. Um, generally, risk-reducing surgery would be recommended. However, if you have a woman who, say, is 35 and on Medicare, um, and she has a mutation that warrants ovarian cancer screening, they would have to cover it um, based on her age and her risk. Um, so this is a, uh, just to make sure that people are understanding. Someone asked if the yearly deductible, your yearly deductible plays into this, but I think the bottom line is there's no coverage. So it isn't that it's going right. to right now, coverage they're after. not supposed to cover it at all. So they can deny no. it. They can just, yeah. if you go and try to get an MRI, Medicare and say, sorry, we're not covering this. Or if you, uh, opt or try to opt to have risk-reducing uh, surgery to take out your ovaries and fallopian tubes, Medicare can say, sorry, we're not covering this. This would just ensure that Medicare has to cover it. If you have to meet uh, a deductible on Medicare or there are certain co-pays, that would still apply with the way the, the legislation is currently written. And again, we would love to see the costs eliminated 100%. But we have to sort of ease into that. We're going to go for the low-hanging fruit and make sure that we have coverage first, and then we can tackle eliminating those co-pays and co-insurance and, and deductibles, just like um, the average risk community doesn't have to pay for maybe their annual mammogram. Um, these are kind of two questions that are asking sort of the same thing. So there's somebody who is successful and worked super hard. And I know she worked super hard to get some of her um, screenings covered. And another person who is also talking about their personal story and um, that what would have happened if or if not, they didn't have coverage. So how does your personal story fit in? to talking about this piece of legislation, if you have you know, personal I think history. Every perspective is valuable. So we have people here who have absolutely been denied services and they can talk about how that impacted them or their families and how other people might be impacted by that. Because let's face it, some of us have the resources to pay for the co-pays or to pay for these services out of pocket but most people don't, especially people who are on a fixed income over the age of 65. For people who were able to maneuver the system and were successful in getting coverage, kudos to you. But even some of the most savvy people have tried that and have still been denied. So you have to say, this is crazy. It's not applied you know, equitably. I ended up being successful, but most people don't have the education or the resources that I have, and many, many people are being denied. And we can give testimonials of denials, um, both for surgery and screenings. And let's say you're here as a healthcare provider or a student or a family member or somebody who works for another nonprofit. You can talk about how this would affect one of your constituents, one of your patients, or how it has affected them um, how, if they weren't able to get this coverage and what the implications would be. It's kind of crazy that somebody who has what we consider average risk of cancer can get all the coverage they need, 
or or somebody who you know but p people who are deemed to be high risk are fighting to do the right thing and so that's sort of how we view this and the whole goal is prevention and early detection and unfortunately medicare when it was set up in the 1960s that wasn't the focus and ideally the whole medicare system would be revamped at this point but that's too big of a, a mission for us so we're just trying to fix this one issue um, at this point. Good. Focus. And I think it's important to, sh to share that if you're not on Medicare and you're currently having these supplemental screenings, when you get to Medicare, you don't have to pay out of pocket. So that's, and, it's, and almost everyone's going to get to Medicare. And that's right. really an important message. The continuum of being... care will be disrupted. And yeah. therefore your ability to uh, screen, or prevent or detect cancer early is gonna be compromised. And that's not a good thing. We have numerous people who are coming into the Medicare system, reaching out to us saying, it was covered when I had Blue Cross, you know, and now yeah, I'm on Medicare, yeah. why aren't they covering this? You know, it's preventive and we're like, yeah. Both so, stories of coverage and not coverage are great stories because right. they show, if I had coverage, look at this by cancer. I, I I haven't been diagnosed with cancer yet. It's all of those stories show the support we need. So don't worry if your story is, oh, I did get coverage because of whatever reason, or if I, I'm not able to get both of those are good, good ways to respond. Absolutely. Um, Any way you mm -hmm. can connect or, mm -hmm. or convey the impact, even if you're not personally affected, that can be effective. Um, and that's now, someone asked, reason. oh, go ahead. I'm just trying to move it along a little bit, Lisa, um, cause we're, we're coming up to time. If someone, um, if someone already has a mutation and they come into Medicare, are they able to get the supplemental screenings? No, no. no. Statutorily Medicare is not supposed to cover them. Nope. Like I said, nope. some people have managed to get it, mm -hmm. but many people haven't. And we're finding even in the areas where they were being a little more lenient, they're starting to crack down. And then there was one other question about how are young people on Medicare? Can you just say, explain that again really quick? So if somebody, uh, let's say you're 30 years old and you have a mental health issue or some sort mm -hmm. of disability that prevents you from working full time, um, then you basically qualify for state and or federal assistance. And so those individuals may have uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid, you could be duly enrolled. And um, even if uh, Medicaid, you know, is supposed to cover certain things because Medicare, you know, they because you also have Medicare, it could interfere. So um, it is complex. I will say it's a smaller percentage of Medicare, but it's still true. I actually know of a woman here in Maryland who has a BRCA2 mutation and has Medicare, and she's in her mid to late 30s. Uh, and Medicare did not want to cover her risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy. Um, so that's a problem, uh, you know, especially because we're supposed to do it younger versus later if we're aware of it. Okay, I think we got all of the questions. Um, again, if I missed one, just put it in the chat and I'll make sure that Absolutely. I can- Absolutely. You know, and again, we later. can talk mm -hmm. more about this uh, at the Q&A and you'll have more resources. Yeah. So yeah. we're gonna move on. I think this one is gonna be a pretty easy thing for most people to grasp. The term step therapy, um, anybody who's ever been diagnosed with cancer or even other types of uh, health issues, uh, is is a term that we hear. It's when a health insurer uh, has the practice of denying coverage of the medication that your doctor prescribed until you try and the, another medication that's typically cheap, cheaper and it doesn't work for you. So um, it, it's called the fail first uh, approach. And one of our advocates astutely pointed out the patient doesn't fail on the medication. The medication actually fails the patient, you know? I mean, um, and 
So there's a lot of problems with this and we're seeing it across, like across all kinds of diseases, everything from diabetes to cancer to ADHD. Um, your health insurance has picked which drugs they want you to try, even if your doctor doesn't think that's the right drug for you. So this is the way it works. Um, essentially, your doctor says, um, I think you should take this therapy. I think this cancer therapy is going to work the best for you. And he goes and tries to give it, get it approved by your insurance. And the insurance comes back and says, nope, we, we don't cover that therapy yet. You have to try one, two, three other therapies, which are typically more generic therapies, cheaper therapies. And you're not allowed to get to the one that your doctor recommended until you try these other ones. Now, what happens? You have to fail on these medications. And when we say fail, that means they don't work for you or they cause negative side effects. And what does that do? That delays your access to the treatments that most likely are gonna really work for you. And you have to do that before the insurance will pay for that medication that your doctor and you decided was right for you. So basically most health plans do this they do it to try to control spending on medications. Um, I think we might have some of our friends from cancer support community online. They're helping us with this effort. Um, they've done a lot of research on this. So basically uh, the insurer covers the treatment that the doctor prescribed, which might be the best treatment because it's a targeted treatment. It's a newer treatment, it has less side effects, but they only cover it once you've tried these other treatments that are typically cheaper. And ultimately what that does is it, can delay access to the most effective therapy for you. And we know when it comes to cancer or some other diseases, delay can mean life or death. So um, part of what's interesting about this is it doesn't take into account your unique genetics or medical history. So for instance, there are certain drugs that work better for people with BRCA mutations, or there are certain drugs that are completely ineffective for people with Lynch syndrome. And so if they if the health insurer says you have to try X therapy and it, we know that it's probably not going to work for you, you're wasting time by having to take that therapy and have it not work or have it cause more severe side effects when you could have gone straight to the therapy that is probably best for you. So we want to figure out a way to not end step therapy altogether, but to help lessen um, the impact on patients. So as I said, our friends at Cancer Support Community have done a, a, an analysis and what they found in their review of claims data for five drugs is that this pr practice of step therapy or fail first doesn't actually save the insurers much money. It actually just means people are trying multiple drugs that may not work for them. Uh, ultimately, it just delays access to the right care and it may worsen the outcomes uh, or the results uh, you know, due to the disease you have. Um, it increases the burden on the patient financially because you have to pay for all these, you know, your co-pays and stuff for all these drugs that may not be working for you. Um, and then of the patients that they, they studied in these, this claims data, the delays actually exceeded, of the ones who had delays, 20% of them, the delays exceeded four months. That's a long time for some patients, especially when you have a really, um, a disease that can impact life or death or debilitate you. So we, we now know this analysis is very crucial. There's information about it in the handout for the lawmakers. We know now know that this practice is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, so this piece of legislation has very, very solid support in Congress. Um, it actually has the most co-sponsors of any of our three pieces of legislation. So it should be a pretty easy pitch is the way I, or an easy sell. Um, I think the only reason people might not be signed on to it is because they're distracted by other things. Um, a lot of times lawmakers have a lot on their plate and nobody has called their attention to certain things. So this one should be pretty easy. The Safe Step Act isn't eliminating step therapy. It's just reeling it in. It will reduce the burden uh, of these 
protocols that the insurers try to implement by providing a very clear process for an exception to their step therapy process. Um, and it would have to be uh, demonstrated or stated very clearly so that patients and physicians understand the process and know how to apply for an exception. The other thing it would do is make sure that the insurers have to respond rapidly. So within 72 hours or three days for an average person exemption, but if it's a if the patient's life is at risk, they have to respond within 24 hours um, because sometimes insurers drag their feet and that can have dire consequences. Um, this is probably a little more in the weeds, but I'm just giving you some of the uh, exemption criteria. So let's say you previously tried a drug and it didn't work for you. That immediately will let you be exempt from trying that drug again. Let's say you previously tried a drug and it was either ineffective or it gave you really bad side effects. Um, that will immediately qualify for an exemption. Um, Let's say based on your genetics, the um, medication is unlikely to work for you or will cause a severe adverse reaction, a bad reaction. Again, that's another reason for exemption. Um, other things is if the drug that they want you to go on will somehow prevent you from being able to work in your job or do average things like getting dressed or showering, as well as if you're you've been on the drug previously or are currently on the drug and you're doing well on it. They can't make you go off of it. So these are all things that would qualify for a step therapy exemption. And there would be a very clear process for that. Um, so essentially this legislation just wants to make sure that all insurers have to have an exception process. They have to make it very available and transparent to the, the patients and their doctors. We think it will increase access to the treatments so that the right patient could get the right treatment that they and their doctor agree on. And ultimately it can probably save both the patient money and even the healthcare system money because we're not gonna waste as many healthcare dollars on ineffective treatments. Um, so we think that's a pretty um, impactful thing that we can do for patients, not just in the cancer community, but across the board. So um, I know I kind of sped through that, but we have a little time left for questions and answers. Um, so any questions about the Safe Step Act? Yeah, good question. How does or does this policy impact plans, insurance plans that outright exclude those specialty drugs? Good question. So if they are outright excluded, uh, unfortunately, that... Um, there, there is an appeal process that can be uh, implemented, but that doesn't necessarily uh, fit into the step therapy process. So the step therapy process says you have to try this drug and it, if it doesn't work, then you have to try this drug and then it doesn't work, then you can try this drug. Let's say the drug that ultimately your physician thinks is best for you is completely not covered by the insurer. There is an appeals process for that. There's also something called compassionate use, which um, there are, there's either a process through the FDA or through um, a, a law that was passed a couple of years ago that would help facilitate that. Um, but if the drug is fully not covered, there's a different process that would have to be um that would have to be used to get access to that drug. Yeah. So the bottom line, this does not address that issue. Unfortunately, just, no. Yeah, we can't force drug makers to cover every drug. Um, yeah. However, there are processes that can be used. It's just separate from this particular law. So this is a good question that I think fits not only this particular uh piece of legislation, but all three is, you know, how do we respond to questions about the increase of cost for insurance companies as a result of the Safe Step Act? Or it might be that might come up about either one, not so much the orphan, but also in the Reducing Hereditary Cancer Act. So I think you've kind it's of talked question. about that, but, you know, I'm saying it, she asked it, this person asked it about this one, but I think it could come it's up. It's a great for, question. You know, so the other um, two as well. in this particular case, um, 
we believe that the health insurer should not be able to dictate your care. That is something that should be between your doctor and you. Now, granted, they're covering these these um, these drugs, but if your doctor has a good reason for recommending a particular treatment, they typically, you know, there's a reason for it. And maybe it has fewer side effects. And yes, maybe it's more expensive because it's a newer drug. It's not a generic. Most of the newer targeted therapies are going to be more costly, but they also can be more effective. So let's say they you try and fail at three less expensive treatments to get to that treatment that your doctor finally thought was best for you. You know how much money they've wasted on those three treatments and how much money, you know, and time that has been wasted. So ultimately we don't, that's why this study that cancer support community did was so important. It really does not result in huge cost savings. Um, and it ha it does take a toll on patients' uh, quality of life and well-being because they're on drugs that are not working well for them. Um, so especially when you're talking about uh, diseases, chronic diseases, life-threatening diseases, uh, we think it's better for there to be a more expedient, transparent process for people to get to the therapy that is probably going to work best for them. Um, and again, I think we can cite uh, the, the research out there. Um, these are questions where if a lawmaker does ask you that, you can mention what I said, but you can also see, you know what, that's a great question. I don't have all the answers. Let me go back to um, the people at FORCE uh, and they will get those answers and then we'll follow up with you. Now, when it comes to the Reducing Hereditary Cancer Act, we we very, very truly believe that um, prevention and early detection are far less costly than advanced, you know, treatment for advanced stage cancer. Now, the argument might be, well, yeah, the longer somebody lives, the more costly they are. But those average year to year costs are nothing compared to treatment for an aggressive cancer um, that might last, you know, for several years. Um, and at the very minimum, we believe that it will be a wash. Um, I do have a handout that will be available to you in the advocacy portal, and it talks about some of those costs and the savings. And it also talks about disparities and how, you know, the people with the most money and the most resources and the most education find ways to get this care, and then it just drives bigger wedges between the communities who don't. Um, and we, we really want to level that playing field. So again, um, those resources either are already uploaded to the advocacy platform or will be in the next day or two, and you can review them. Um, you can feel free to share them with the lawmakers. Um, but again, you don't have to have the answers to everything. You can say, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure, let us get back to you. And so um, that leads us to, actually, let, before I move on, is there are there any other big questions around that uh, legislation? Um, I think before we move on, just a little bit about how you use your story to support these different pieces of legislation so that that's clear to, sure. to everyone. Okay. Everybody thanks. has knows, everybody here, has a reason for being here. Either you're personally affected by hereditary cancer, you're at high risk of hereditary cancer, you work with hereditary cancer patients, or you serve the cancer community in some way. So even if you're not personally impacted, you can use your own experience to say, you know, I personally haven't experienced this, but I know that if my mother was diagnosed with this cancer uh, or you know needed genetic testing how this would affect her if she couldn't get access or how the patients that i work with every day are impacted because they can't afford things and how frustrating it is to find out you're high risk of cancer or to have cancer and then struggle to get access to the appropriate medications or services so i think we can all um find a way to communicate that story, even though we come from different perspectives. I will also add that 
in your meetings, our goal is to have a mix of people with different backgrounds and perspectives. So ideally in every meeting, there will be at least one previvor, one survivor, and one healthcare provider. And then there might be some a family member or other stakeholders as well. So everybody brings a perspective to the table and you never know what's gonna resonate with that lawmaker. So everybody will have an opportunity to briefly share why they're there or why they're participating. And depending on what resonates, the lawmaker may say, wow, that's interesting and engage you in a conversation based on a certain person's story or perspective. Um, and that doesn't minimize anybody's story. It just means that something resonates with the lawmaker. And if that helps them get on board, that's great. But that's part of the reason we bring different stakeholders with different um, situations together, because you can balance each other, you can support one another, and you can see what might resonate with the lawmaker or their staff. Does that make sense? Probably. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So um, those of you who were registered before the past day or two, today you should have gotten an email um, about the Advocacy Day platform. And we'll give you, um, give you more details on that. But in that platform, you will find your meeting schedule, information about the lawmakers or the staff you'll be meeting with. You'll also get to see who else is in those meetings with you and that and the resources that you need to support you in those meetings. Um, there's a one pager on each piece of legislation that will be shared with the lawmakers. And then there's some supplemental information about cost, about um, disparities. And we've also developed a script um, so there's kind of a long script and an abbreviated script. Everybody has a different style. Some people really feel the need to be walked through exactly what to say, whereas others are a little better at sort of ad-libbing. Um, the majority of meetings are 30 minutes. And believe it or not, 30 minutes is not that long when you're talking about three pieces of legislation and you're trying to you know, connect with the lawmaker. So we, we're trying to give you some brief talking points. You don't have to cover every single detail. There are a few meetings, typically they're with Senate offices that are only 15 minutes. And that really just gives you the basic amount of time to say, here are our asks, Here's why they're important to us. And we would really appreciate it if you would consider sponsoring or co-sponsoring. I want to note that in some cases, lawmakers are already a sponsor of the, legislat of the legislation. And there are going to be notes about that in the platform. Um, if you accidentally say, would you please co-sponsor? And they say, oh, I already am a sponsor. You can just say, oh, my goodness, so funny. Ha ha. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Um, but if they are a sponsor, you say, thank you. We really appreciate your leadership and your support. If they're not a sponsor, say, hey, we'd love it if you would co-sponsor this. And then in a few cases, people are in very key committees. So in the House and Senate, they have committees that oversee certain pieces of legislation. And the path for a piece of legislation to ultimately move towards passage typically involves one of those committees agreeing to have a hearing and to discuss that piece of legislation. Um, and some pieces of legislation have had hearings and some haven't. So if if you see in your notes, hey, you know, this lawmaker is on the Senate Finance Committee, would you please encourage the committee leadership to have a hearing? That's because that lawmaker is in an influential position and a hearing would really help us move this legislation forward. Um, again, these are details that'll be in the portal, but don't be stressed out if you don't memorize all this. The lawmakers and their staff are just happy to connect with you, and they don't expect you to know everything and to be the experts on everything. Um, so this is what the email that you should have received or will receive um, should look like. And actually, it says May 2nd, but this was sent today for most people, May 8th. Um, if you didn't see it in your inbox, 
check your spam or junk folder. Um, and for those of you who just registered in the past day or two, you should be receiving this by tomorrow or a day after we get you registered. So just be on the lookout for it. Um, also note that when you get into the platform, we are still a week out from Advocacy Day and schedules could change still. Um, lawmakers are very busy. So we, maybe we scheduled a meeting with um, Senator Murkowski at 3.30 p.m. And all of a sudden her office said, wait, we have a conflict. We need to move it to 1.30. Um, the advocacy scheduling team will make that change as long as you don't have another meeting at that time. So keep checking the advocacy platform because those times could be updated as well as your fellow advocates who are going to be in the meetings. You also might notice that in your meeting schedule, you're going to see some meetings have been confirmed and then some meetings have been requested. That means that we sent a request out to that lawmaker and we haven't heard back from them yet. Uh, again, we have a scheduling team at Advocacy Associates and they are following up on those uh, requests. And we are gonna try to get as many of those meetings scheduled as we can. When you look at your schedule, if you realize that you can't participate in one or more meetings because you have a conflict, just reach out and let us know. Uh, or the Advocacy Associates team know, and we'll take you off the schedule for that particular meeting. Um, because ideally, you're going to work with the other people in that meeting to decide who's going to say what. And um, when you look at the script, and we'll follow up on this with some emails, you'll decide, okay, you're going to take section one, and I'm going to take section two. And depending, for instance, a person who's had cancer might feel more connected to the step therapy bill or the Orphan Cures Act versus somebody who is a previvor might understand the implications of not having access to genetic testing or the screening services. So you'll figure out what you're most comfortable with um, and then you'll divide it up with among each other. Um, again, most meetings are gonna have between two and four people so that you're not carrying the load all by yourself. In some cases, we might have up to five people. Um, meeting etiquette, I don't need to go through this. Everybody has gotten used to Zoom. My only suggestions would be to mute so that if you have dogs or kids in the background, they're not disturbing the meeting. Um, dress somewhat professionally, you know, no hoodies or anything. Um, and don't use any crazy backgrounds. You know, I think that's pretty straightforward stuff. Um, and oh, I need to mention that we do have some sponsors. So we have ASI, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company, and we actually just added Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. Um, so they are offsetting the costs of us doing this advocacy day, as well as the small donations that you all made. I know it seems crazy, but for us to do even a virtual event, it costs about $20,000. Um, and this is the first time, uh, you know, that we're actually um, offsetting that cost. We feel that this effort is very important. Um, but at the same time, it's always uh, an investment in everything we do to bring these programs to life. So that is um, the end of what we need to share with you tonight. Here is our contact information. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And again, um, the team at Advocacy Associates, they're gonna be the right people to talk to about any technical issues with the platform, any questions about your confirmed meetings or your scheduled meetings. Um, whereas if you have more questions about um, the legislative asks or anything with that kind of context or how to share your story effectively, that would be things that Lisa Peabody and I can help you with. Um, but just know that you reach out, we will help in the best way we can. Um, so Lisa, I'm just going to go through these, I answered these questions online already, but I just wanted to read them quickly so people could, you know, just share them quickly. Great. Um, one person asked if there was, because I know we're out of time, if uh, three, if there's three people, how do you know the order? And I just explained that the order of the, and the suggested 
language is going to be in the script so they can manage it that right. way. The and script is not it, set in stone. You can mix no. it up if you want. Our hope no. is still just that you can cover all three pieces of legislation while sharing a bit about yourself because your story is very important. Yes. And there isn't a specific timing that you have to spend on each piece of legislation. I think each meeting is different and you'll see mm -hmm. how long it takes. But, you know, you might have to say, let's move this along because we have two other pieces of legislation to talk about. But we'll you may that see you. that a lawmaker has a lot of interest in one particular piece of legislation. Sure. And if they have a lot of interest, that's great. Try to at least mention the other pieces of legislation and say, I'm so glad, you know, you want to talk about this. We do have these other pieces of legislation we wanted to discuss. We didn't really get to chat about it. So we're going to follow up with you. Um, you will have the opportunity to follow up with an email thanking whoever you meet with. And with that email, you will have a chance to personalize it and add additional details. Um, or you can come back to us and say, I think you should follow up with this lawmaker. Or you'll have a little um, meeting uh, questionnaire after each meeting. And you can say, you should follow up because we didn't get to touch on this or they had questions about this. Um, so you kind of each meeting is a little bit unique, but you, you just kind of go with the flow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, and this was a question about our meetings usually with staff or lawmakers, and I just explained how important uh, most of them are with staff, but they're so important that the staff, they usually know more of the nitty gritty of the policy than the lawmakers do, and they're going to report back. So your impression, they're like the gatekeepers. They're the, they are the first step to get your policy and your advocacy heard by the lawmaker so making an impression on them is really super super important and don't be surprised if they're if they're young they're usually they're usually harvard students and a lot of yale grads and they're young but they're so quick and so smart and i'm always impressed with them yeah and they are the eyes and the ears of the lawmakers i i've seen that uh we actually have a few lawmakers who are planning to join the calls but you know, which is amazing. It shows a real investment um, in the topics because we've already given them a heads up about some of our concerns. But don't be surprised if they get called into, you know, an emergency vote or they get pulled into an, another important meeting. Uh, just know that whoever you meet with will report back to their boss. And um, typically the folks you're going to meet with are the ones that specialize in healthcare or Medicare policy. So they are going to be relatively knowledgeable about what you're talking about. And um, there was just one more question about registering, um, about registration, whether it was still open. And I just explained it was closed except for some specific states. Right. Um, and I don't think, I don't know if we need anyone in Colorado. That was the specific state. So we can um, just follow up. We might be able to use somebody else in Colorado. I, I think we have two people in Colorado now, maybe three. I'm um, going to look right now. It wouldn't hurt to have one more. Um, mm -hmm. But in some states, for instance, we have seven to 10 people, which is lovely too. But we can't have everybody in the meeting with their senator. So, um, we have a list of states where we're uh, actively seeking additional people and we're limiting registration to those states. So um, we have the those states currently listed on our website and we're happy to share it if you want to reach out uh, if there's somebody who might be interested in participating. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we have, I see two in Colorado. So, that's so we great. could use one or two more in Colorado yeah, if, uh, sure. if there's someone who's interested. Great. All right. Um, I think I've I've answered all the questions great. online. If anyone else has one, you can always uh, speak at the question by hovering over that reactions at the bottom and raising your hand or unmuting to see that. And just know that this was recorded. So we're going to download that recording and we will share the link in the next day or two, so that if you want to go back and re-listen and review it, you have that option. Uh, for some people, they weren't able to make the training. Um, and then if you have additional questions, we are having a drop-in on Monday uh, afternoon. It's from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And 
Even if you drop in for five minutes just to have one question answered, that's fine. It's completely optional, but we're there. Lisa and I will be there to field any questions. Uh, so feel free to do that. We will share the link for that in the next day or two as well. We just didn't want to confuse people with multiple Zoom links. Uh, and then the resources for Advocacy Day, those are definitely all going to be uploaded to the platform. Most of them are there, but we might have some additional ones to add, uh, specifically the scripts in the next day or two. Um, and once you have a chance to review those, again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. The information for the people that you are partnered with in your state, their contact information should be available and accessible to you in the platform including their phone, cell phone number and their email address. We ask that you be respectful, do not spam people. I'm not really concerned, but that information is there so that you can reach out and say, hey, everybody from Pennsylvania, let's connect and see, you know, let's chat for a few minutes or email back and forth and figure out who's gonna talk about what during our call. Um, and make sure that we all get to have a part of this important meeting uh, without, you know, um, one person having to lead everything. We think it's important. Some of you might be more experienced advocates, while some it's this is your first time, but we still want everyone to have a say. We want everybody to feel that they have a part in this. And um, so you might see that the more experienced advocate may say, hey, this is the way we've done it in the past, which is great, but we wanna make sure that everybody gets to have um, a say. And also note that the healthcare providers uh, who participate, there might be some genetic counselors or doctors, um, know that they bring a unique perspective as well. And um, you know, we definitely want them to be able to have uh, a little bit of input on how this stuff impacts their patients. So I think we are at time and we're going to wind it up. So thank you again to all of you. We really, really value your time and your energy and your participation. We couldn't do this without you. Um, and we are here for any questions you have in the future. So thanks again. Have a good night. Go have a good rest of your evening and keep an eye out for additional emails and information over the coming days. Have a good night. Take care.